Every day, hospitals and health systems see patients who are victims of human trafficking. It's far more widespread in America and around the world than many people are aware of. And for that reason, it's one of the main focus areas of AHA's Hospitals Against Violence initiative. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast brought to you by the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hederly, Senior Writer at AHA and your podcast host. Many organizations are committed to combat human trafficking, including the U.S. government. The Office on Trafficking in Persons, or OTIP, is a part of the Department of Health and Human Services, and like AHA, it promotes tools, resources, and training for healthcare and social service professionals in order to prevent and reduce the harmful impacts of human trafficking. OTIP works to raise public awareness and protects victims through identification and assistance, helping them to rebuild their lives and become self-sufficient. How is the battle against human trafficking going? Is all this effort making a difference? In this podcast, Catherine Chone and Ashley Garrett are speaking with discussion moderator Robin Begley, AHA's Senior Vice President and Chief Nursing Officer. Robin is also Chief Executive Officer with the American Organization for Nursing Leadership, or AONL. Welcome all, and thank you for tuning into our Partnering to Combat Human Trafficking podcast. It is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Catherine Chong is the founding director of OTIP and senior advisor on human trafficking at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. OTIP is responsible for developing strategies and implementing programs to prevent trafficking, increase victim identification and access to services, and strengthen the health and well-being of survivors. OTIP also collaborates with government and non-government partners like AHA to raise public awareness, identify research priorities, and inform policy recommendations to strengthen the nation's public health response to human trafficking. We are also glad to welcome Ashley Garrett. Ashley is the director of NITAC. Ashley is a victim advocate with almost 20 years of experience in training, technical assistance, and program management of human trafficking victim assistance programs. She has worked in the United States and with more than 20 countries to help build multidisciplinary programs on behalf of survivors and those most at risk of human trafficking. Ashley oversees NITAC and works with communities across the United States to build capacity to identify and respond to the complex needs of all individuals who have experienced trafficking and address the root causes that make individuals, families, and communities at risk of trafficking. Welcome, and let's begin with our discussion. Catherine, could you please tell us more about the work you do with the Office on Trafficking in Persons and how that work supports healthcare leaders and providers? Healthcare providers and institutions are integrated across all of our programs. The majority of our funding goes towards victim services to provide comprehensive case management services for survivors of human trafficking and many of our grant organizations in local communities partner with healthcare providers on the ground to meet the health and medical needs of survivors. And then when it comes to building the capacity of communities and first responders to respond to human trafficking in a trauma-informed way, we provide training and technical assistance that Ashley will describe a little bit more And healthcare providers and institutions are a critical part of the community response to human trafficking, and so they're a key audience for us. And then third, we have been uh, working to strengthen research and data collection regarding human trafficking. Uh, Most recently, the CDC updated its ICD-10 codes to include data elements for both sex and labor trafficking, and healthcare providers have been at the forefront of advocacy for more research on human trafficking, stronger data collection standards, and then, of course, implementing research and data initiatives in the field. Ashley, could you tell us more about NITAC and the resources available to our hospitals and health systems? Absolutely. 
NITAC, um, the National Human Trafficking Training and Technical Assistance Center, was established by OTIP, so we work with Catherine very closely, to support expanding the response of a public health approach for targeting communities, organizations, and professionals who are most positioned to reduce the vulnerabilities of those most at risk of human trafficking, as well as increase the identification of those that are both at risk and those that have experienced trafficking or have a past history of trafficking. And then we also deliver technical assistance to increase the access and quality of the short, medium, and long-term resources and supports for survivors and their families. Within NITAC, we have what we call the Sorta Health and Wellness Program. It's one of three parts of our programming, and I think it's the one that's most applicable to health systems and to the AHA membership. In particular, through the SOAR program, we've created a three-tier structure of intervention and technical assistance and training, which was really informed by the healthcare sector and professionals who were able to inform us on what they needed to best be able to respond to this issue that is impacting their patients and clients. At an individual level, we target individual professionals through online, on-demand training that's accredited. We offer upwards of eight to 10, depending on the unit, CEs and CMEs, as well as deliver that training in person. And that's really targeted at the individual professional to understand what it is they need to know and how they need to respond differently to better serve their individual patients and clients. At an organizational level, we know that human trafficking cannot be responded to by a single individual. And so we also have a, what we call SOAR for organizations. We're actually piloting that right now as we speak with AHA membership. And the idea around that is to provide a six-week training course that supports institutional leadership and organizational leadership to transform their organization to better respond to their patients and clients' needs as it relates to human trafficking. And then finally, human trafficking doesn't function in a vacuum, and our patients and clients live and and we work as professionals in communities. And so we have specific training focused at a community level as well. All of the training that we do, once it's done through piloting, is accredited, so we really know that that's an important piece for many of the health practitioners in particular. And our training is always rooted in the best and the most recent evidence base. So we're annually updating our training to make sure that it reflects the ongoing and evolving research. We always want to make sure that it is covering all forms of human trafficking, so both sex and labor trafficking, as well as all the types of individuals that may be in harm's way. And it's really driven and in a trauma-informed and culturally and linguistically appropriate approach. And finally, the training is rooted in build, it's been developed by experts, practitioners, doctors, and clinicians, but also, really importantly, individuals that have lived experience directly as survivors, who are some of our most important teachers in understanding how we as professionals can transform our behavior to better serve their needs. So why is this work so important today? And what is the role of healthcare in ending human trafficking? When most people think about the response to human trafficking, whether it's members of Congress or state and local leaders or even community organizations, uh, they might think, you know, it's the responsibility of law enforcement or it's the immigration issue, it's the national security issue. Uh, But human trafficking is also very squarely a public health issue. The harms of trafficking impact individuals, uh, families, and communities. And there's a lot of work that we still need to do on prevention. And one of the reasons why this work is so important today is because healthcare professionals are very much on the front lines of working with and serving individuals who may have experienced trafficking or are at high risk for experiencing trafficking. And just to give you some perspective, about 15 years ago, Uh, When I was in the field as a case manager working with survivors of trafficking, there were so many late nights, weekends, at all hours of the day when we brought victims to, victims and survivors of trafficking to emergency rooms. They had dental health needs. 
We sought out even dermatologists to see if we can treat skin issues or tattoo removal, and then also the significant substance use and mental health issues that came from the compounded trauma of the violence of human trafficking. And in those early years, it was really hard to find culturally appropriate and trauma-informed healthcare providers. There wasn't a lot of knowledge on what human trafficking was. It was sometimes seen as, you know, maybe this is a form of child abuse or domestic violence or some other issue. And so there has been so much progress that's been made in the last 10 to 20 years in regards to leadership coming from the healthcare sector, institutions and professional associations like the American Hospital Association. And that has paved the way for survivors of trafficking to have improved experiences in the healthcare sector. And that's made a big difference. And so the reason the work is important today is squarely in terms of our ability to meet the health and mental health needs of survivors of trafficking and finally be at a place where we're not only focusing on quality of health services, but now as a field, we're moving more towards prevention. So when I look at the role of healthcare providers in ending human trafficking, I see how healthcare providers are often one of the few community contacts for individuals who are still in situations of human trafficking. They provide a safe space, and that's an opportunity for intervention or prevention, especially when healthcare professionals are working with those at high risk for human trafficking. I would also add, I think, that one of the things we know from research is that over 67% of adult survivors of human trafficking, both labor and sex trafficking, have shared that they experienced and received care and treatment of health practitioners while they were being exploited. And they did not receive, they were not identified as being trafficked, and they did not receive the kind of care and response that they needed at that time. So one of the things we're really trying to do is get in front of that, right? So, for example, our SOAR program, we've been collecting evaluation data on that for over, for a couple of years now, and our participants are really what we're trying to do is help them understand better who and what and how human trafficking works, and that's really important, but even more importantly is what do they need to do differently to better connect with their patients and clients in a way that they are really patient-centered and understanding what the full and complex needs of that individual are, both themselves and their families, because this is not an individual crime. It, it is multi-generational. And so when we look at the statistics around our evaluation of the SOAR program, once people have taken the SOAR training, they are identifying over 90% of a confidence level in being able to identify and respond to human trafficking at a very high or high level. So we're really trying to get target that 67% of patients who experienced trafficking did not get identified. How can we change those practitioners' knowledge? I also, kind of going back to some of what Catherine was saying, you know, I come from working as a victim advocate, which means that someone has to have experienced the crime in order to be identified as a victim by law enforcement or community organizations. And that's a critical response that we had to get in place, and we've been building that in our country and internationally for over 20 years, but it's reactive. And the opportunity we have with a public health lens and really targeting our healthcare systems in particular is that they are at the position where they can really get in front of this crime. There are ways that people can be identified as high risk and that if there's more information and skills related to what that individual patient needs, then we can start to actually be proactive at reducing and eventually ending human trafficking. What would you say are the key takeaways you would like to share with healthcare leaders and providers as they learn more and take action to do their part in combating human trafficking? I have three key takeaways for healthcare leaders and providers in their response to human trafficking. One, 
we're already seeing the difference that healthcare institutions are making in uh, responding to human trafficking. We know that they're connecting the dots between the experience of the violence of trafficking with other forms of violence that they may see in hospitals, clinics, waiting rooms. More healthcare providers are calling the National Human Trafficking Hotline. More healthcare institutions are calling the hotline to be part of the national referral directory because they feel that they're in positions of offering services for survivors of trafficking. We also would want healthcare leaders and providers to know, and this is just reinforcing what Ashley had said, that we have free online accredited trainings for healthcare providers on human trafficking to provide just a foundational baseline of knowledge so that they feel more confident in their ability to recognize and respond to human trafficking appropriately. There are several training programs out there, but the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has this free online training program that is accessible 24 hours a day. And then finally, for healthcare leaders and managers, the healthcare system itself can do a lot more to understand the labor trafficking component of how human trafficking impacts supply chains and services procured by healthcare institutions. There have been a number of federal investigations of trafficking schemes bringing in healthcare workers from abroad to provide nursing, home health, and other healthcare services. And so, uh, just as industry leaders to recognize some of the fraud and the trafficking schemes that are happening potentially among its workforce, whether it's healthcare workforce or janitorial services or any other part of the healthcare system. And then in regards to supplies that are procured through forced labor and labor trafficking, whether it's medical equipment and supplies that may enter the hospital supply chain, I think that this is just another element from a business perspective that healthcare providers would want to have a greater understanding about. And uh, uh, we at the Office on Trafficking in Persons in the upcoming years will provide more guidance and information on how healthcare institutions are impacted from a procurement and supply chain perspective. But I at least wanted to put that on the radar because Healthcare leadership on this issue is comprehensive from providing quality care and access to care to helping communities look more upstream on prevention and assisting with data collection efforts and then chapter ahead in regards to procurement and supply chains and having a hand in combating forced labor that exists in the U.S. is also a key role. I would say at a minimum, if what, you know, we as individuals, as practitioners, as clinicians, as folks that work in health systems and in broader public health sectors, we get into this work because we want to make a difference in someone's lives. These individuals, whether they're at risk, they're currently experiencing trafficking, or they experienced it 15 or 20 years ago, they are already our patients. We are supporting and working with them. And if we can better understand how to respond to their needs and the entirety of who they are, their health outcomes will become very different. Trafficking is, a, is often individuals experience a variety of different violent and traumatic experiences in their lives. Their ACEs scores are often off the charts. And so we are already serving these patients and the cost, both financially and personally, to both the individual patient and client, but also our staff and our health systems that are frustrated because they're not able to see the results that they want and that our patients deserve. So that's, I think, a piece is that these aren't people that we're not seeing. It's the understanding around human trafficking is how can we be more effective at serving who we already are seeing. I also think that healthcare systems in particular, there are particular risks are important for health systems from a business perspective to understand. I think Catherine really highlighted both the supply chain, the vulnerabilities in subcontracted labor that might be working in your health systems already. It's an opportunity for the mission and the business to come together and really lead in the business sector how an organization or a system can respond and bring those together. 
And then finally, I would say you know, one of the things we really see in trafficking is that there are many forms of trafficking and that the majority of understanding around the world, as well as in the United States, is heavily emphasized on sex trafficking. And that is an incredibly important population that we must serve. But we are not understanding or serving our labor trafficking survivors in the same way. And healthcare systems in particular are seeing those patients. And they can really help to inform an understanding of what human trafficking really looks like on a global and at a community level by looking for all of the different vulnerabilities that people have and helping to inform our understanding of how human trafficking works and functions currently and how can we collectively come together at a community, an organizational, and a global level to really respond to this issue. Well, I'd like to thank you both very much for all the insight and learning that you have shared. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It was wonderful talking with you today. Thank you.